It's been a long road to modern synthesizers like the ultra-compact Uno Synth Pro. In the mid-1970s, synthesizers were built using mostly discrete electronics. This made them big, expensive, and often unreliable. It was a Silicon Valley company called Solid State Music, SSM for short, that created the first ASIC designs, application-specific integrated circuit for music synthesizers. We have here with us two of the SSM team members, Dave Rossum and Dan Parks. Dave and Dan have recently begun making synthesizer chips again as SSI, Sound Semiconductor Incorporated, carrying on the legacy they began over 45 years ago. So Dave and Dan, thanks for joining us. Great to have you guys here. Good to be here. So for myself and so many others, the SSM chips were always regarded as sounding superior to the Curtis chips. For example, a Rev 1 or Rev 2 Prophet 5 uh, will sell for double what a Rev 3 Prophet 5 will sell for today on the vintage market. And then somehow to validate this, uh, last year Dave Smith released the Rev 4 of the Prophet 5. And to differentiate the Rev 4 from the old Rev 3, he added your new SSI filter chip in addition to the, the classic Curtis filter chip that's in the Rev 3. So you could basically get the Rev 1 and 2 sound of the classic SSM chips and then the Rev 3 sound of the Curtis chip. What's your impression of this? So first of all, I, I have to say that uh, you know, Doug was always a friend, uh, very much a gentleman. He was just a wonderful guy. Um, I used Curtis chips and EMU products as well as SSM chips. So while there certainly was um, uh, animosity that's long since been resolved when uh, Sequential sw shifted over to using the, the Curtis chips, one of the things that if you knew Doug, you would, you would know this was true, was he would never um, consider expropriating somebody else's intellectual property. So um, I think one of the reasons that his filter sounded quite different uh, from ours was that he just avoided anything that could have been at all similar to the chips that I had designed and came up with his own ways of doing filters. And when you do that, they're going to have inherent differences. And uh, um, I'm sure also, because Doug was a brilliant guy, I have no question that had he um, had the incentives first, he probably could have come up with the designs that I did, and, and probably the same uh, the other way around. Um, but uh, we sort of got there first with the, the designs that had um, m more friendly, had more character in, in the filter. And, and so I, I, absolutely there is a difference in the sound of the filters. We all knew that. Again, I'll, pro I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt that I was, uh, that the filter I loved was the SSM 2044. Uh, that's the sound that I really like, and that I always consider the 2040 a little bit inferior to that. But uh, one of the things I love about musicians is that they discover where to use a sound, and the SSM 2040 uh, fits into more places in modern music. Uh, a lot of people just absolutely love that sound. Plus, there are ways of, uh, more ways of tweaking the, the 2040 to, to get it to sound a little different by just external analog tricks. And I think people are doing that as well. So absolutely, the filters sound different and the, the 2040 uh, has a really interesting sound. And Dan, uh, synth enthusiasts like myself uh, rejoiced a couple of years ago when we heard that you and Dave had started SSI, basically uh, taking the legacy of SSM and putting the band back together. Uh, tell us uh, the story behind this. Uh, we reconnected around 2016 or so, I think it was at a trade show. Um, and at about the same time, I mentioned I was a bass player, I got interested in synthesizer bass. I wanted to start playing um, synth bass. And I was kind of shocked, since I had not been paying attention, that there had been this huge renaissance of analog synthesizers. Um, and it just kind of occurred to me that, you know, uh, maybe uh, there would be an opportunity there. Uh, and I felt, always felt like I had some unfinished business in that field. So I contacted Dave and 
there is pretty much zero hesitation out of Dave about, yeah, this is a really cool idea. And I mean, we had any idea how we were gonna pull this off on the supply chain side, about putting together a team, um, but it surprisingly uh, came together uh, quite easily. And um, our first chip was an update to the SSM 2044, the, the ladder filter that he referred to as the SSI 2144. And it coincided correctly with uh, Dave Smith's Profit X uh, because he wanted a you know, filter chip for that. The timing was really good in that regard. And, and as you suggested, there has been a great reception um, for this enterprise, which is in um, the Uno Pro. So, as I mentioned in, uh, uh, when we were starting up uh, Rossum Electro in 2015, we dropped by Dan's Groove Tools booth at, at NAM and said hi, just because he was an old friend. We hadn't seen him for a long time. And, you know, then just, I think, probably briefly broached the subject of uh, a possibility of, of resurrecting SSM and the, and the chips. Um, and Rossum Electro, you know, as soon as we began to exist, we get emails. Well, no longer because we've done it, but for, for the, you know, the next many months, we were getting, you know, how about you go into the business of uh, um, making the SSM chips again? And it didn't make any sense for Rossum Electro. We, we want to be making instruments rather than chips. But when Dan got in touch, that was why it was such a no-brainer to say, of course, is because we knew the demand was there in the Eurorack market and also with some of our professional contacts. Uh, but I think we decided early on that uh, rather than you know, bringing back chips from decades ago uh, with the, you know, the technology for terms of process and manufacturing technology and two really, really great chip designers, that's kind of a waste. It's, I think it's a much better thing to design um, ICs for, well now, 2021. So that's really our focus is to develop new ICs rather than, you know, look too closely back to things that were done back in the 70s and 80s. So what is it about these chips that makes them sound so special? What's, your, what's in your secret sauce? As a musical engineer, you explore ideas. Um, I have a design style that is, uh, you know, tends to be very simple. And I also, I have a love of inventing. So I love to invent new circuit topologies that I haven't seen before and maybe nobody's seen before. I, I think, you know, you, you never really know until a part is in production, how it's going to go into the music because it's the musicians who do the magic. They're the ones that really make the sound into, sound with a small letter into the sound with a capital letter. Um, that's something I can't do. I'm, I'm not a musician. Um, you know, I do my best to give musicians tools that they can use, um, but then I have to just let them go and, and, and just see where they go. When we designed the IK Uno Synth Pro, it was absolutely critical to us to include uh, gate and CV I.O. on the back of the unit to allow it to interface with external equipment and of course uh, specifically with Eurorack systems. Um, Dave, you've also gotten deeply involved in the Eurorack world with uh, your company Rossum Electro Music. You've made some really, really innovative modules and you've sort of come full circle from you know, the original EMU modular uh, all the way to the Eurorack Euro system. Um, what do you what what are your thoughts on the resurgence of modular synthesis and specifically the Eurorack phenomenon? I think the idea of of making a synth that can be plugged into Eurorack is going to open up a, a marketplace and um, uh, again expand that that musical experience. That that maybe someone who uh, is drawn to a keyboard synth because he wants a keyboard and the Eurorack doesn't do that. If if he can then you know buy a couple of modules and plug them onto his keyboard, he can now begin to explore that modular world. And similarly, somebody in the modular world can, can now have a keyboard that they can easily put in and explore that aspect of sound that they may never, never have wanted originally to get into keyboard music, but uh, it's, it's a way to you know, dip your toe in and see, is this for me? Dave, in your experience as a product designer, of course, in addition to using great 
chips, great semiconductors. What's also needed to make a great synthesizer? A great synthesizer is a classic synthesizer. Uh, you know, the Prophet 5, the Emulator 2, um, those are classic synths. So is the, the, the Yamaha DX7. Um, and all of them have to be very well engineered. You've got to not only have the, the sound path um, capable of creating the sounds, but you've got to be able to, to um, have the, the control structure, the, um, everything about the instrument has to allow those to be accessible to the musician. Um, but I think you also need to be able to allow the musician to exercise his creativity. To, to get a sound that is unique to the individual and to the song that's being performed. Um, and then, you know, I said it before, you know, there's, there's some dumb luck involved too, that uh, 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 the sound has to be right for the time. You know, the SB1200 uh, was the right sound at the right time to be able to inspire a, a new generation of artists who never, many of them never even realized they were artists until they heard that sound and it spoke to them. Um, and so uh, I don't think you can plan to make a classic synth, that it sort of happens, but you certainly can uh, engineer things so that they are capable of being classic synths.